the law and you a look at laws in st vincent and the grenadines which affect our daily lives the law and you law presented and by you. lawyer panel r campbell qc and brought to you on svg tv as a public service ladies and gentlemen brothers and sisters boys and girls greetings welcome to another presentation in this public service nation building series the law and you this is program number 846 coming to you on Monday the 21st of November 2016. On this program I will speak to you on the topic the five grungs for divorce. But before getting into the topic a few short preliminary comments and as usual I begin with expressions of condolence to all those families which have suffered recent bereavements, particularly bereavements caused by violent death. Recently we had a spate of homicides which have shocked the nation. Unfortunately, we are well and truly into end times and the nation will continue to experience traumatic events of this nature. As I speak, and you are hearing me hours after I've spoken because this program is being recorded in the afternoon and you are viewing it in the night. But I believe as I speak, the funeral is taking place in Barley of Brother Francis, uh, John, and uh, um, unfortunately, I cannot attend funerals on Monday afternoon. So as much as I would have liked to have been there, can't be there, but I did send my condolences to the bereaved family, of, particularly to my good friend and brother, Raul Kopijan. Now, I have decided to keep the preliminaries at a minimum because the topic is on the lengthy side and I wouldn't wish to run out of time. However, I want to say by way of uh, gratuitous promotion that there are two events coming up that I would like to commend to the general public. Firstly, on Thursday this week at half past six at French's house in Kingstown, my friend and brother Cecil Blazer Williams will be launching his second novel. I don't think I know of any Vincentian author who has published two novels. Many authors have, not many, but several authors have published a novel, but for Blazer, this will be his second novel. And it, it promises to be an interesting book called A Stirring of Radicals. And he did indicate to me that it is based around the time of the late 60s, the early 70s, of the so-called Black Power movement in St. Vincent the Grenadines. And I do look forward to reading that book. So an invitation is extended to the general public to come to French's house Thursday evening, well afternoon, 6.30, for Blazer's second novel. And on the 1st of December, another Thursday, but this time in the morning at 9 o'clock, um, my good sister Sylvia Williams Gould will be launching her own book. I will tell you more about this 
next week Monday DV. So just look out for Sylvia on the 1st of December. But this week will be Blazer's time. Okay, that's as much as I want to say by way of preliminaries. And let me go into the topic now. The topic is not strictly speaking correct. Let me repeat. The topic is not strictly speaking correct. But I have put it that way to make it more understandable to you all. And I will explain precisely what is the position. In that I've called the topic the five grounds for the divorce, for divorce. But really and truly there is one ground for divorce. But it is provable by five facts, any one or more of five facts. So I should really have called the topic the five facts for divorce, but then that would have sounded strange, wouldn't it? Yes, I could see you nodding, if not visibly at least nodding in your mind. Yes. So we'll talk about the five grounds for the divorce, but the one and only ground on which a petition can be su successfully launched in court Seeking the dissolution of a marriage. Dissolution means the dissolving of the marriage, which is another long term for divorce. The marriage is dissolved. You see, marriage is a legal contract. A divorce brings that contract to an end. The contract is put to an end. It is dissolved, unraveled. And the one ground that the law specifies in the Matrimonial Causes Act is that of irretrievable breakdown of the marriage. That is, a person who files a divorce petition in the High Court has to prove that the marriage has broken down irretrievably. That is, it can be put back together again. Like Humpty Dumpty, all the king's horses and all the king's men cannot put Humpty Dumpty back again. Well, that is what the law is looking for. Because a marriage is a contract which has to be taken seriously. In the Christian tradition, marriages are sanctified by God. And the good book says that whatsoever God puts together, man should not take asunder. But as in so many spheres of life, man-made laws have altered divine laws. And divorce laws constitute one of the species of alterations of divine law. There are some faiths that do not allow divorced people to be remarried. Others would allow them to be remarried on certain conditions. Well, it is not my intention to get into that. In any case, I'm not really qualified to get into that aspect of it. I can de only deal with the legal aspect of it as set out in the Matrimonial Causes Act. But the same act that says divorces can only be granted on proof that the marriage has broken down irretrievably, the same law goes on to say that to establish irretrievable breakdown, one has to allege and prove at least one of five facts. And it's those facts that I have mislabeled grounds. Lawyers loosely speak about them as grounds, but strictly speaking, there are five facts. If you file a divorce petition, you have to allege at least one of them to base the petition upon. Of course, you can file a petition and allege more than one. 
but you have to allege at least one and it has to be written in the petition which is filed and the person who causes a petition to be filed who is seeking the divorce is called the petitioner and the other person against whom the divorce is sought is called the respondent. Now there's such a term as a co-respondent but I wouldn't get into that. So what are these five facts which I have loosely called grounds in the topic of this discussion? Well, firstly, and not in any order of merit, but just numerically, there is unreasonable behavior. Secondly, adultery coupled with intolerability. Thirdly, desertion for at least two years. Fourthly, separation for at least two years with the other party consenting to the granting of the divorce. And the fifth ground or the fifth pact is separation for five years, whether or not the other party consents. So let us look at each in turn. Firstly, unreasonable behavior. This is one of the facts which you can allege and prove if you are seeking to have your marriage ended. And just as an aside, you have to wait until you have been married for three years before you can file a divorce petition, unless you allege and prove that you simply can't wait for the three years by reason of exceptional hardship or exceptional depravity on the part of the respondent. And it is difficult to establish exceptional hardship and exceptional depravity, but if you can establish one of those or even both, then you can file for divorce before the marriage is three years old. Otherwise, you have to wait till you've been married for three years before you can file a petition. So let us get back to the five facts, the five grounds, as I have loosely called them. Firstly, unreasonable behavior. If you are relying on that as the basis for your application for a divorce, you have to prove that the respondent has behaved in such a way that you, the petitioner, cannot reasonably be expected to live with the respondent. So for short, that is called unreasonable behavior. Now, what constitutes unreasonable behavior? Well, the law doesn't spell that out. The law leaves it to parties to come to court and complain about this, that, and the other. And then the judge will decide if what you have complained about, if true, if that can sustain the allegation that the marriage has broken down irretrievably. Now, cases of violence are normally sufficient to prove that ground of unreasonable behavior because the law does not excuse any spouse from violence against the other spouse. The law does not excuse any assault, any physical violence at all. But the law goes further. It does not excuse psychological violence. You know, you can torment a partner in the marriage without putting hands on the partner. Just by the things you say and your general conduct can practically drive the other spouse mad. 
constant criticism, constant debasing somebody, constant insulting somebody, constantly demeaning the other party can give rise to a situation where the other party, who is the victim, can come to court and allege unreasonable behavior. So that the circumstances which satisfy the allegation of unreasonable behavior are infinitely variable. But basically the law is looking for conduct which makes it practically impossible for somebody to remain living with the same person. So that how you treat the spouse is very important. So if you can prove unreasonable behavior to the extent that the judge feels that that justifies you not being able to live with the person, then the judge will regard the marriage as having been broken down irretrievably. Second ground, adultery and intolerability. No. Adultery alone is not sufficient as an allegation to sustain a petition for divorce. The spouse who brings the petition, the petitioner, if he or she is alleging that the other party has committed adultery, has to go on to prove and that is the important point. And you, the petitioner, find it intolerable to live with the respondent. Now, there are cases in which one spouse may be found guilty of adultery or may be accused of alleged to be adulterous. And the other spouse may then decide, okay, well, I'll forgive you and you know, I put up with it. And the case of the former President of the United States brings to mind, Mr. President Clinton. You remember he was, um, well, embroiled in adulterous conduct. But the wife decided to forgive him and she put up with him and got licks for it, but a lot of people admired her. You know, stand by your man, blah, blah, blah. All right. So the second ground is that you have to allege and prove that the other, the respondent, has committed adultery and the petitioner finds it intolerable to live with the respondent. So it's adultery coupled with intolerability. Now, if you allege adultery, you have to prove adultery. It is not enough to say you suspect that the respondent has committed adultery. You have to offer some kind of proof. If you can show that the respondent has, in the case of a man, has fathered a child out of the wedlock during the time when he was married, well then, clearly, a married man cannot father a child out of wedlock without having been adulterous, <laughs> because Adultery means having sex with somebody to whom you're not married. So in cases where a woman is alleging that a man has committed adultery, it would be enough if she proves that the man has fathered children, or at least a child, out of the wedlock, and for whatever reason, and she will give particulars, she finds it intolerable to live with that man. So if that ground is alleged, and evidence has given the dissatisfaction of the judge, then one can achieve a divorce on that ground. Third ground, desertion for a continuous period of at least two years, immediately preceding the presentation of the petition. That means that you have to show that the other party has deserted you. Desertion really means has left the matrimonial home, expressing an intention, either by words or by conduct, not to return. And if that lasts for at least two years, 
then you can go and file a petition as soon as the two years are up and allege, look, this person has deserted me. And if you can prove that, then you would have satisfied that ground. The fourth ground is two-year separation, where the petitioner can allege and prove that the respondent and the petitioner have been living apart for at least two years, immediately preceding the presentation of the petition and the respondent consents to the divorce. So if you are basing your irretrievable breakdown on the grounds of two years separation, you can only sustain that allegation if the other party, the respondent, agrees to sign and say, yes, I agree that we should be divorced. But if the other party said, look, I'm not signing, if you're alleging two years separation, then you have to wait until the conditions are fulfilled for ground number five or fact number five, separation for at least five years. Now, if two parties to the marriage have been living apart for at least five years, immediately preceding the presentation of the petition, that is immediately before you file the petition, at least before your lawyer files the petition. Whether or not the other side consents is immaterial. You can get a divorce based on five-year separation because the judge has to presume that after you have been living apart for five years, then clearly that marriage has gone through. Unless, of course, suppose one party to a marriage goes off to study and does a degree course in a, in a country that doesn't permit him or her to come back in between. And the person gets a first degree and goes on to do a master's in another year and then goes on to do a doctorate for another year or two. You can't go to court as a married person and say, look, my spouse has been away for five years, I want to divorce him. The judge would not regard that as necessarily meaning that the marriage has broken down. If the person has been abroad on a legitimate reason, suppose the person is working for an international organization, and has to be away for an extended period of time. That doesn't mean that the person has gone because the marriage has broken down. So if there are circumstances which explain why the parties have been living apart for five years, the petitioner would most likely not succeed. But if the petitioner can show that the living apart for the five years was voluntary on the part of the respondent, and that, that indicated that the respondent had ceased to treat the marriage as subsisting, had ceased to regard the marriage as being of um, any, any substance, then you can simply prove that by giving examples of conduct. The person may have written some terrible letters and say, look, I'm glad to be rid of you. I'm not coming back. You know? <laughs> If a person says that and they stay away from you for five years, then quite clearly they really don't want to continue with the marriage. Now, nowadays, very, very few divorce petitions are contested. That is, you would seldom hear of a case in which Somebody files a petition for divorce and the respondent says, no, 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 we are still happily married. I'm resisting that petition. Not that it can't happen and not that it doesn't happen, but it's very infrequent. Usually, by the time one spouse ends up in a lawyer's office and tells the lawyer, look, I've come here to ask you to file a divorce petition for me that is pretty good evidence that the marriage has broken down irretrievably. And the marriage cannot be sustained by 
the affections of one party alone, no matter how much a wife loves a husband, if the husband has no use for her, then she can say that she has a happy marriage, vice versa. No matter how much a husband loves a wife, if she has no use for the husband, he can say that, look, we're happily married. We're living in fool's paradise. So those are the five facts by which one can prove irretrievable breakdown, or the five grounds, to use the term loosely. Intolerable behavior, adultery, and intolerability, two years desertion, two years separation with consent of the other side to get the divorce, and five years separation. If you can allege one of those and prove that allegation in court, chances are the judge will pronounce that the marriage is over, having been broken down irretrievably. But that pronouncement by the judge doesn't mean that that is the end of things because if there are children involved and if there are property issues, if there are maintenance issues involved, then the parties have to go back to court to deal with those ancillary matters. Okay, well, I hope that has made the position a bit clearer and indicated why you cannot go to court and simply say, look, you're tired of the, the spouse, you want a divorce, and cite that you can't get along with her because of this, that, and the other. You have to come stronger than that to persuade the judge that the marriage has really broken down irretrievably because the judge will bear in mind that there was a time when both of you stood before man and God and vowed to live together till death do you part. Okay? All right. So that is all from this program of the Law and You, program number 846. I look forward to being a further service to you next week, Monday TV, for another presentation in this public service nation-building series, The Law and You. Do have a pleasant week. See you at Blazers launching Thursday afternoon, 6.30 at French's house, a storing of radicals. And may the good Lord continue to bless us all. The Law and You, a look at laws in St. Vincent and the Grenadines which affect our daily lives. The Law and You, presented by lawyer panel R. Campbell, QC, and brought to you on SVG TV as a public service.